the devatas are very successful and they are rejoicing their partying and at that time a yaksha a strange being will appear to them at a distance burn it and show me and agni is not able to burn it when indra approaches that yaksha that is exactly what happened to scientists when quantum mechanics happened this story is giving a different interpretation of the double slit experiment actually india is one country which is not supposed to glorify knowledge they are actually trying to comply to the template given by the rest withdraw your light so that i can see you upanishad doesn't always talk of going from darkness to light they are not knowledge systems they are knowledge challenging systems that subtle point is where india's contribution is there is a story in kena upanishads symbolic story there are devatas and they have some great success at some point and they are partying thinking we did some great thing and at that time some entity will appear to them at a distance a yaksha a strange being will appear to them at a distance and they look at it what is this and indra the king of the devatas will ask the other devta he will ask agni go and find out what that is who, who that is agni will go near agni will ask who are you first that yaksha will ask who are you agni will say i am fire i can burn everything yaksha will show a piece of grass something and ask the agni to burn it burn it and show me and agni is not able to burn it agni goes back says i cannot find out who this is strange fellow indra sends why <clears throat> Yaksha will ask why you who are you why you will say I am why you I can blow away with Yaksha will keep a small speck of something ask why you blow this away why you is not able to blow why you goes back to Indra says even I I don't know who this is strange fellow I am not able to do what he asks my powers are not working then they say go you yourself go Indra you only go when Indra goes when Indra approaches that Yaksha the Yaksha vanishes. the yaksha vanishes and in his place uma will manifest this is the story uma will manifest and indra will ask who was that uma will say that was brahma so that is what this line says na ena deva apnon purvam ashit all the sense faculties <coughs> are referred to as devatas in the upanishads indra here represents the king of the sensory faculty the sensory epicenter your mind if you try to grasp your true nature using the mind it will vanish you won't be able to see it instead you will only see uma uma means in sanskrit uh, the dhatu ma or mas also it refers to matra measurement uma means something that has measure uma means a quantized reality devas sensory powers cannot approach it cannot acquire it cannot grasp it because it could have gone before itself before indra goes there it will vanish it cannot catch it instead you can only see uma you will start seeing some manifestation <clears throat> and you it may become hallucinatory also you can engage in uma and have early success also but if you are not sensible it can hallucinate you also you can engage you in your thought forever in the realm of measurement in the quantized reality it will never allow you to go to the quantum continuous entity which underlies quantum you know when there is a lamp when there is a candle the candle cannot light its own base they use this example this metaphor uh, sometimes for some other purposes to tell that uh, in a simplistic sense that you can see everybody's fault but you cannot see your own fault is the talk of it like that but it is much, it is true in a much more fundamental sense also there is some support there is the base of the lamp there is candle the substance of the lamp there is wick and then there is light that light can illuminate everything but it cannot illuminate from where it is arising because it has already gone it has already passed the base has already passed light cannot go back to the base it's a very simplistic analogy to tell it 
moment to moment before light can happen, the base has already happened. The light cannot capture the base. So much has already happened before the sensory power has happened. And the sensory power, that light cannot illuminate from where it has come. The quantized reality cannot capture the continuum. Continuum can give rise to quantum. Quantum cannot capture continuum. And this uh, aspect that when you try to approach the core of life, it vanishes and instead you will only see Uma, it actually gets manifest, it actually gets expressed. In physical reality also, scientists actually, this story, whatever is there, expressed in the Upanishad, that is exactly what happened to scientists when quantum mechanics happened. They, tried, they didn't try to go inward and they didn't try to go to the core of life. Here, they try to go to the core of life somewhere there, <clears throat> and there also it manifested in some way, not exactly like this, but partially it manifested. I will not tell you the details of it, but when you go into the, when you try to zoom into physicality, and you just try to dissect physicality, go into the roots of it, trying to find out with the conviction that I will, I will find out the roots of physicality, I will grasp physicality, but when they entered the subatomic realm, it became exactly this. When they are not observing it, when the sensory power is not witnessing it directly, it behaves like a continuous reality. There is a continuous aspect to physicality which manifests at the roots of it, at the depths of it. Because although physical reality is the quantized reality, what lies underneath it is the same reality that lies underneath you also. You can appreciate your continuity. Matter may not be able to appreciate the continuity that underlies it. You will be able to see, yes, I have quantized, I have body-mind and beneath, beneath it there is something continuous. There is a thread which is continuous. But the same thread exists beneath matter also. So objectively, if you study matter, if you go to the depths of matter, the continuous aspect which underlies matter will in some way manifest itself. That is what is called as wave-like behavior. Matter started behaving as if it is waves, continuous waves, which is spread across the space. But when you try to capture that, when you try to measure it, the wave nature goes away and it collapses into a quantum particle. Uma. When they try to say, I will grasp the roots of physicality, I will grasp reality, I will grasp truth, and they went into the roots of physicality with that conviction. Yaksha vanished, Shiva vanished. They can infer it, there is something more. Yaksha is there, they could see, of course, you know, even in the story, the devatas could see the Yaksha from a distance. They could see something. They wanted to know more about him, he vanished. You can now. <laughs> With your sensory power, you can infer. There is something more to me. But if you get arrogant with your sensory power, okay, I will capture it with my knowledge, I will grasp it, it will vanish. Instead, you will only capture your own tail and you will go around and around like a dog. So exact same thing happened with those scientists, actually. Whatever happened in the Upanishads happened to scientists in an objective way. So as you can see, this story is giving a different interpretation of the double slit experiment, actually. Usually, what they say is that you, as the conscious observer, are influencing the inert physical reality, which is the observed. But in the Upanishad story, it's the reverse. Here, the observed was the Yaksha, which is Brahma or the substratum of existence. So, the elusive wave-like behavior manifesting in the depths of physical reality corresponds to that strange yaksha. The wave function, which is a continuum, is a partial manifestation of the substratum of existence. And you are the indra, the sensory power that is meddling with it by trying to measure it. And therefore, the continuum aspect vanishes and it collapses into a quantized entity, which is uma. So the Upanishadic uh, depiction is actually the reverse. And also, in the usual interpretations, 
uh, they also jump to things like the whole world is unreal and it is within your consciousness and such things but from the upanishadic interpretation of the double slit experiment we can only say that the world exists as a quantized reality because you exist as the sensory power that is all we can say the world exists in this way because you exist in this way and that is what maya also is umaya or maya it's the same thing maya means that which has measure so world exists as maya as a measured quantized reality because you currently exist as indra a sensory faculty a measuring faculty so our concern should just be to see if there is something more to us beyond the sensory faculty afterwards let us see what happens to the world we don't have to conclude now about what the world is that it is unreal etc it would be incorrect and uh, inconsequential for a seeker to jump directly to such statements and conclusions so what i'm trying to point out is that what happened in the upanishad story happened to the scientists in an objective way so nine of deva apno and four of mashti if you try to capture it <clears throat> with your sensory power of which you are so proud of which gives you everything which gives you success in life the devatas were successful in whatever they did that's how the story begins the devatas are very successful and they are rejoicing their party in thinking we did something great and that is when the yaksha will appear at a distance and they want to find out now what is that so similarly we are rejoicing in our sensory power it is giving us so much bounty so much success and whatever and with that arrogance if you try to approach the core of life life will vanish and you will be stuck with yourself here so this is a very beautiful line which captures uh what hap what happens to you <clears throat> if you try to approach truth holding on to your sensory faculties wherever the candle goes the base cannot it cannot see the base is behind it it can see everything else except its own base so that is why in the later verse i am mean, connecting it to another verse in a later verse the upanishad says hidden my ena patrena satyasya pihita mukham it says truth is being covered by a golden lid and the next verse also says emphasize on that saying asking truth to withdraw light withdraw your light so that i can see you so what is actually covering truth is your light sensory power sensory power is light here in your experience that's what you think is light and that is what you glorify always knowledge you glorify knowledge is light knowledge which is an outcome of your sensory power with knowledge you will never be able to capture it this is a very subtle point i am telling because no matter how much this is said you will realize that this habit of yours is very deep rooted this allegiance that you have to knowledge is very 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 deep rooted it doesn't go so easily it gets expressed everywhere by glorifying knowledge glorifying knowledge india is one country which is not supposed to glorify knowledge so it pains me when i see people glorifying knowledge saying upanishads are great knowledge they are indian knowledge systems they are not knowledge systems they are knowledge challenging systems even if you want to call it a system it is not a knowledge system it is not trying to give you more light make you grow more bright and that is why upanishads are called vedanta which literally means end of knowledge usually they translate vedanta as the last part of veda but uh, actually they are not the chronological ending of the veda chronologically it would be atharva veda but upanishads regardless of when they were told were always called as vedanta because they deal with the ending of knowledge upanishads are trying to end your obsession with knowledge so that something more can blossom it is trying to take away your light withdraw your light so that you can see what is at the base of all this and that is why these upanishads talk in this paradoxical terms upanishad doesn't always talk of going from darkness to light it talks of going from light to something else also sometimes see all the time everywhere people talk of truth 
symbolically as light, 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 light. You can talk of it in one way, you can talk of it like that. But the thing is, don't conflate it with knowledge, don't conflate it with the learning. All these things are conflated, no? Knowledge is light, learning will give you light. That is realization, that the whole thing is conflated. Do you realize, do you understand this? That subtle point is where India's contribution is. That subtle point is where Upanishads' contributions are. That is where spirituality comes into the picture. But in reaction, what they are doing is, because Western people will always glorify knowledge. I'm not telling the entire West. There are some people there who realize something more than that. But the characterization, characteristics of Western civilization is the glorification of the psychological faculty in knowledge. And this colonial influence is so deep-rooted in India today, they don't realize what they're doing. They will say, I'm talking, I have, you want, we have to come out of the colonial influence, but they will go on glorifying knowledge. They're actually trying to comply to the template given by the West. West is telling knowledge is great, knowledge is light. So now Indians are telling, oh, we also have knowledge. We have ancient knowledge systems, Upanishads. It is not a knowledge system. Upanishads are actually telling knowledge will block you from seeing sensory power and the result of <laughs> sensory power, which is your knowledge, altogether will block you. And if with your knowledge and sensory power, if you try to approach truth, truth will vanish. You will never be able to realize. 